Creating successful international environmental treaties is a lot like being a contestant on the Great British Bake Off. To be star baker, you need to get the ingredients and the method exactly right. You need the right balance of style and substance. You need to make sure your bread dough isn't overworked or underproofed, and your pie had better not have a soggy bottom. And even if everything went perfectly during practice, the weather outside the tent can change things drastically, especially when it comes to chocolate. Plus, you're doing it all under the watchful, judgmental eyes of Paul Hollywood. The right recipe and conditions can be crucial for international relations, too. And not just when it comes to the definition of biscuit or pudding. It can mean the difference between a successful, perfectly proofed environmental treaty or an underbaked, soggy bottomed flop. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. On your marks, get set, bike! Usually, no one's thinking about international agreements in the Bake Off tent, unless it's the ill-fated Mexican week. But outside of the tent, treaties are formal agreements and contracts between countries that lay out each country's responsibility and goals. They're a way to hold each other accountable as they work together. When it comes to the future of the planet, treaties are both helpful and necessary to get everyone on the same page about what changes to make, what things to avoid, and what goals to prioritize. When they work, they can make a huge difference. Like with the delightfully named Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone layer in 1987. It's considered one of the world's most successful climate treaties, and its success is due to a few key ingredients. First, it relied on scientific information. See, back in the 1970s and 80s, CFCs used in producing refrigerants and aerosols were damaging the ozone layer, which protects Earth from the sun's harmful UV rays and us from a terrible sunburn. Thanks to a savvy group of scientists, governments around the world quickly got wise to the fact that making a big hole up there was going to end in disaster down here in the form of more cancer and damage to marine life and plant growth. So countries got to work on an international agreement that would ban the production and consumption of those chemicals and, with luck, save the ozone layer. The recipe called for industries and companies in participating nations to phase out their use of CFCs in production and manufacturing. That was a big ask. Banning the use of cost-effective, money-making CFCs meant that economies around the world could take a financial hit. If they signed, each country would be making a legally binding agreement to slow down important manufacturing processes and give up financial gains from using CFCs. But to cushion the financial blow, the agreement promised that richer countries would make the shift to alternatives like HCFCs and HFCs first. Later on, we learned that those weren't great either, but at the time, it was the better option. Poorer countries could keep using the older, ozone-depleting chemicals for longer. That meant CFC eliminated nation targets hit earliest for nations with major industrial activity. As more industrialized nations used their massive pool of resources to shift away from CFCs, they shared new technologies with poorer countries, who had softer targets for CFC elimination. The Montreal Protocol recipe also included another crucial ingredient, peer pressure. Countries that didn't get on board with the agreement couldn't make trade deals with participating countries. So as CFC elimination snowballed, more and more countries had to get in on the action. When it was all said and done, 197 countries, aka practically all of them, signed the Montreal Montreal Protocol, and it made a huge difference for the ozone layer and everything under it. The Montreal Protocol wasn't a fluke, either. A similar recipe worked well in the Mekong Basin in 1995. There, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam signed the Mekong Agreement to better manage and conserve water in the Mekong River Basin. They also wanted to protect the health and livelihoods of millions of people who rely on the river for water and jobs. And they wanted to help protect the biodiversity of the region, including species not found anywhere else in the world, like the Irrawaddy dolphin. The researchers started the process by making sure they had the right ingredients to solve their problem. They amassed as much knowledge as they could about the river system and used that data to create basic guidelines. A recipe, if you will, that would help countries clean up the Mekong River Basin. They split the recipe into steps based on priority. For instance, the first step was establishing a process to track water quality over time. Then they could move on to the other steps, like creating more hydroelectric power and using adjusted river flows to irrigate their farmland during droughts. By following these steps, countries were able to improve the water quality all along the river. And they have continued to monitor and study the water in the river and work to improve life for people and dolphins. Unfortunately, later climate treaties haven't had quite so much success. In 1997, countries signed on to a new climate treaty, the Kyoto Protocol. Like we talked about in our episode on climate change, this international treaty was designed to limit greenhouse gas emissions. And since it worked so well for the Montreal Protocol, the UN started by using the same recipe. But just like patisserie week is more complicated than baking a pie, curbing greenhouse gases proved to be more complicated than phasing out CFCs or saving the Irrawaddy dolphin. And by this time, weather conditions outside the tent had shifted. 
This time, wealthier countries were frustrated that they were legally required to lower emissions, and developing nations weren't held to the same legal standards since they weren't emitting at the same level. The United States never officially joined the treaty, and countries like China and India that didn't have to limit their emissions expanded rapidly, meaning they produced more emissions instead of less. The Kyoto Protocol also forgot an important ingredient. While the Montreal Protocol had plans to spread out losses and create long-term financial gain, the Kyoto Protocol didn't incentivize a transition away from greenhouse gases to make it economically lucrative over time. In the end, world leaders decided that the environmental benefits weren't worth the immediate cost, and the Kyoto Protocol was ultimately a flop, like a trash can baked Alaska. But it did teach us that future treaties needed ingredients that prove climate action is a worthy investment instead of an impossible sacrifice. So when it came to the Paris Agreement in 2015, the UN focused on putting science at the center of environmental policy. Since 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has been studying and reporting on the science behind our changing climate. One of their findings was that if global average temperatures increased by 2 degrees Celsius, the planet would experience more frequent droughts, heat waves, floods, and other extreme weather events. So the idea of limiting the increase of global average temperatures to less than 2 degrees Celsius, and ideally closer to 1.5, became a key ingredient in the Paris Agreement. Unfortunately, scientific evidence is like yeast in a loaf of bread. Without it, your bread won't rise. But if you only have yeast, you're not going to make a Hollywood handshake-worthy loaf, especially if you don't even have a recipe to follow. See, in 2015, instead of going back to the winning recipe of the Montreal Protocol, which set legally binding agreements for everyone, the Paris Agreement didn't set legal limits for anyone. The UN knew that strict legal terms would reduce the chances that nations would sign on and ratify the Paris Agreement. Instead, they let countries make individualized plans to address climate change based on vibes, or what their government thought was doable politically and technologically. It's like how Bake Off contestants get a brief for the showstopper challenge, but then they can make whatever they want within those guidelines. Then countries have to present their results to the judges. Every five years, they're required to report on and revise their climate pledges. The UN was counting on this reporting, creating peer pressure that would push countries to ratchet up their emission goals every five years. Kind of like peeking across the tent during the technical challenge to figure out what the heck a tennis cake is supposed to look like. Since every nation basically got to write their own climate agenda, joining the Paris Agreement was pretty painless. And since there wasn't any legal enforcement baked into the treaty, countries could make grand plans and worry about following through, or not, later on, like a contestant who decides to wing it. In the end, a bunch of countries set a bunch of targets for when, how, and how much they'd cut fossil fuel emissions, and have failed to meet them ever since. In fact, none of the countries with the largest greenhouse gas emissions have reduced them enough to meet the treaty's goals. Along with having guidelines as vague as a technical challenge recipe, the Paris Agreement underestimated how difficult it is to translate environmental knowledge and technological solutions into action and impact, especially with a challenge as big as climate change. That space between what we know and what it takes to solve the problem is called the knowledge action gap. It's like you might know that a Victoria sponge is made with flour, sugar, and eggs, but if you don't know how to put those ingredients together in the right way, you end up with a sloppy mess, not a cake. And even though we know the science says that we need to phase out of greenhouse gases ASAP if we want to curb climate change, putting that knowledge into action is really complicated. Part of the problem is that disinformation has muddied the waters around what we should do about fossil fuels to make a difference. Like, some people or companies may try to convince us that fossil fuels aren't that bad when it comes to climate change. Or climate doomers may make us feel like there's literally nothing we can do, and we should just give up already and throw the cake in the trash. Plus, fossil fuels are just one sustainability problem in a big ol' meat pie of issues, and we have to figure out how to close the knowledge gap on each one. That's not easy. New scientific insights and policy changes can lead to shifts in our understanding and strategies for addressing the issues. And fixing sustainability problems can impact local and national economies, the job market, political contests, and our day-to-day -day lives. That's a big deal because the choices our governments make have a trickle-down effect. If a government isn't serious about making big changes, it's harder to convince folks like you and me to make tough, climate-forward choices like not driving cars or passing on an international vacation. So governments need to be thinking less vague, technical challenge recipe and more super detailed minute-by-minute -minute action plan for baking four cakes, 18 macarons, a chocolate collar, and spun sugar in four hours on a humid day. In some ways, that's what the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are for. They help break big problems into smaller, more manageable chunks that give us more focused goals with clear priorities. Everyone knows knows what the end result should look like and how we get there, but we still need to follow through. Right now, things don't seem to be going well for the Paris Agreement. We missed an ingredient or two, our buttercream is melting, and the mousse hasn't set. But time isn't up yet, and changing the plan halfway through the challenge isn't easy 
tea, but every once in a while, a contestant throws a cake in the trash and starts over, or decides to leave out the spun sugar that's not working, or figures out how to salvage the oozing custard and crack sponge. And if we can keep our cool, focus on the task at hand, and figure out how to salvage the mess, we could still have show-stopping results. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your favorite Great British Bake Off host, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.